church. How is everybody? Yeah. Come on, guys. Give Jesus a round of applause one more time. Yes. You guys have a seat. Hope you are glad to be in God's house today. If you are a first-time guest, thank you so much for being here. This, I don't care what your past experience has been like. This is what church is supposed to be like each and every week. Everybody say fun. Um, there's no greater place to have a good time than God's house. Um, it should never be, never should be boring to come into God's house. Um, you should be inspired. And um, worship is uh, like this automatic physical, emotional, and spiritual response to the goodness of God. So um, if you're in here and you're new to this and you got bumped like five or six times, it's just because the person that's next to you is really excited about what salvation is and the fact that it's come to their house. So, and our, our, our prayer is the same for you. And we use this analogy a lot in the South, but it is absolutely true. Do not get more excited about Alabama's national championship than you do the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. Because um, that's, that's true victory. Everybody say victory. And that's really what we're talking about in this series. We're in a brand new series entitled Life. Everybody say Life. Um, and the whole theme of this series is to help people step into um, what we feel like is robbed from us each and every day. Um, the truth is, and we kind of explained this in week one, Jesus said that he had come that, that you, me, everybody on this planet would have life. Everybody say life. And he went on to say, and live it to the absolute fullest. That the invitation of the gospel, the invitation of God is, is not to struggle through life the best that you can and, and kind of get into heaven with, by the seat of your pants, even though the seat of your pants are slightly smoking and you just kind of got in. Even though being here on the planet, you would say, was a living hell all my life and I hope to get to heaven one day. Um, that, that's not the gospel. That's not what the Bible teaches. Um, God, God didn't send Jesus to die on this planet to get you into heaven. He sent Jesus to this planet to die to put a little bit of heaven in you. Um, that you can actually live the life that the Bible talks about, this life of joy, this life of legitimate happiness and power and strength and courage, and where every day literally is an adventure. Like, Walmart is not punishment. You actually look forward to it at some level. And like, I know you go, well, can we just look forward to the gas station, not Walmart? Okay, so, like, there's steps, but, like, here's, here's the deal. Um, and we just met Chris and Casey, who are missionaries in South Africa. You, if you're a born-again child of God, are a missionary wherever you go. You, you don't have to move to China. You don't have to move to South Africa. Um, you're a missionary to Decatur, Alabama. You're a missionary to Morgan County. You're a missionary to Athens. And your job, to, your job, your calling on life, is to engage the community and the people around you by letting your, the Bible says, let your light shine before men, that you would glorify your Father in heaven. So this entire series is about don't be small in who you are. God called you and equipped you and empowered you to be great. Everybody say, I'm great. Amen. Look at the person you came with and said, I'm awesome. I'm awesome. Now, here's the deal. Some of you didn't do that. Um, and in a very, I'm not saying that to be funny. Here's why. Because you believed a lie. And sometimes this lie is perpetuated by Christianity. Oh, just sit there and be what I like to call sinfully self-deprecating. Here's what I mean. I'm nothing. I can't do, and some of it is true. Here's what's cool about the devil. The devil will use the truth of God's word, twist it, deliver it to you out of context to defeat you. Is the truth you're nothing? Yes. But is the truth that the God that indwells you is something extraordinary? Yes. Are you a child of God? If you've embraced Jesus, you're forgiven. You absolutely are. So stop walking around like a poor homeless person and walk like the, the, the child of God that you are, a born-again, redeemed, forgiven, powerful individual who walks in anointing and gifting that the world desperately needs. That's called life. Everybody say life. So if you weren't here in week one, um, we talked about that, uh, maybe you heard this phrase in the Bible called in the beginning. Remember, you know where that's at? Like, it's in the beginning and the end. Okay, so we're, we started with in the beginning, God created man and woman. He placed them in the garden, and the garden was awesome because we were all naked, and we all wish it was that way now, but it's not. I'm glad you're not naked, but I'm just saying, like, it would be cool to, so he put us in the garden, and it, everything was perfect. <laughs> Y'all just got that. He was like, oh. Okay, so, like, he put us in the garden, everything was perfect, and it was, it was awesome, and it was, it was beautiful, and it was true. It wasn't a fantasy land. We think so much that the Garden of Eden was like this 
theoretical story where God's trying to set up something, and actually it was true, it actually happened. He created man and woman, he placed them in the garden, and it was awesome, it was perfect. And then the, the enemy came on the scene and he lied to us. And the first lie was so asinine. God says, I've placed you in this garden, you can eat of any tree you want to. I'm going to say any tree. But there's one that you don't need to eat of because if you do, you'll surely die. And the enemy comes on the scene and says, oh, hey, here's why God doesn't want you to eat of that tree. Because if you eat of that tree, he knows you'll be like him. The reason that's a lie is because they were already like God. Genesis 1.27 says God created them in the image of himself, male and female, he created them in his image. They were already like God. They didn't need anything. They didn't need to do. I must say do. They didn't need to do anything to be more like God. They were already created in his likeness, in his image, and the enemy lied to them. And what they chose to do was choose the lie over the truth. And we talk about in week one, every sin begins with choosing this. I'm going to choose to get a legitimate human need met outside of the provision of God. That's all sin is. And we want, and the devil wants us to focus on the fruit of the sin. We talked about it in week one. And the fruit of the sin may, may for you be, I have a porn problem. Um, I have a Twinkie eating problem. And we like to label sins to make us feel better. But the truth is, if you use sugar as your addiction, you're just as sinful as the crack addict. And we talked about it in week one, got lots of awesome emails. Thank you for giving me your opinion, but you're wrong. Um, <laughs> Because here's what we're doing. We're saying, God, I have a need. I'm stressed. My need is peace and security. And so instead of trusting you, I eat Twinkies and drink Dr. Pepper. And, and I have a need for relationship and security and relationship. And instead of turning to you, I turn to a computer screen. And it fleshes itself out in addictions to pornography and crack and sugar and overeating and control and manipulation. But we, as a, and the church has done a terrible job at this we say stop looking at porn stop overeating stop 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 and all we're doing is agreeing with the enemy to get you to focus on the fruit because isn't that what he did in the beginning he said look at the fruit of this tree this the whole time in your life as a Christian he says look at the fruit on your tree it's bad fruit which makes you a bad person because he knows if he can get you to focus on the fruit you'll never address the root which is choosing the lie over the truth. If you're in here and you feel lonely, I got great news for you. You're never alone because God is always with you. Even if you're here and you don't even believe in him, he's still there. See, the fact that I believe in God doesn't make him real. He's real, so therefore I believe in him. And if you're here and you're searching for him, he's in this place and he's speaking to you. And you know what's cool? You know it. In all my days of talking with people, I've met a lot of people who label themselves as atheists, but I've never really met one. Everybody believes in something. You know inherently you're created for more than this. So at best, people who don't believe in Jesus are at best agnostic. I've never really met a true atheist. Even ones who say, oh, I'm atheist. No, you're not. I stick a gun to your head, you'll become inherently religious really quick. That's just the truth. So the fact that if you're here and you're agnostic, atheist, Muslim, whatever, and you're here, the truth is you're looking for truth. And we're going to discover some of it today. But stop looking at the symptoms of a root problem and start focusing on the root of the issue. And it's always been about choosing the lie over the truth. And so last week we engaged that by talking about shame. Everybody say shame. And shame is this place where it becomes who you are, not what you've done. We talked about the difference between guilt and shame. How many of us in here are guilty of doing dumb stuff? Okay, how many of us are guilty of sin? Okay, everybody, like your sin is not raising your hand right now, okay? So now, now you're lying in church. You're guilty of sin. It says, thou shalt not lie. Okay, so who's guilty of sin? Everybody raise your hand. Listen, stop. Put your hands up. It does not make you Pentecostal if you raise your hand in church. I know some of y'all Southern Baptist background, some of you Catholic, we haven't stood up and sat down near enough for you. You don't feel like you've been to church at all. Presbyterians, you're waiting on the real wine to come through. Listen, we have all these thoughts that, well, if I don't do this, no, no, no. If you raise your hand today and I ask a question, does it, you're not charismatic, you're not going to handle a snake, because we don't do that here. We do not, our campus, we do not handle snakes. <laughs> Please tell everybody. Do you know Decatur believes we handle snakes in here? Listen, we will, as long as, we will never touch a viper. <laughs> we'll talk about it in a minute. 
no, not even spiders, okay? So none of that in here. So listen, don't, don't worry about giving it one of these. And I would say this, if you're in worship and you feel like propelled to raise your hands and you don't, that's a spiritual issue. It really is, because it's a sign of surrender, a sign of reaching out. And people say, it's not a big deal if I raise my hands. No, it's a big deal. Because it just does, it connects your heart to God. Um, so, so to encourage you to do that, I, I'm encouraging you to do that because there's freedom in it. I can, I can remember being a, being a non-hand raiser when I first got saved. And you start out here, and you go to here, and you, like, some of you can't raise your hands because you got on your kid's shirt. You know what I'm talking about? You raise your hand. And you... <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> do whatever you got to do, but just get to a place where you can raise your hands and celebrate all that God has done in your life. Because truthfully, you may feel like in here, in here I'm, I'm safe from the lies. And honestly, in here is where the lies attack most. Like, I'm speaking the word of truth, but yet there's a voice in your mind saying, that's dumb. That's not true. And so we're trying to do the best that we can to expose the lie so that you can live life and life to the fullest. And shame is where you say to yourself, I am my sin, and I am a victim of the sin of others against me. If you do that, you'll never be victorious, and that's the lie. But the truth is, Romans 8 says this, Now, therefore, there is no condemnation, if I say shame, for those who are in Christ Jesus. You need not be ashamed of anything, because you've been forgiven. The slate's been wiped clean. God says in his words, I've forgotten it, so stop bringing it up. And so last week we had an altar call, and you came down, and you confessed some stuff you were ashamed of, and I hope, and our prayer was, that would be your last altar call for that issue. Stop reminding God, because he's forgotten it and forgiven you of it, and it's covered under the blood of Jesus. So the problem is we choose the lie over the truth, which is why Deuteronomy 30, 19 says this, I call heaven and earth to witness against you, everybody say me, that I have set before you a choice, life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live and your descendants. Here's what God is saying to us in Deuteronomy. We don't often see it this way. I'm giving you a choice between the lie or the truth. Choose the truth because the truth always, I'm going to say always, brings life. So today we're going to deal with something that everybody in this room deals with to some level. Fear. I'm going to say fear. fear. If you deal with fear, raise your hand. To the ones that didn't raise their hand, deal with fear of raising their hand. The ones, like, we all deal with it in some, some way. So what is Webster's definition of fear is um, this. It's dread, terror, horror, fright, timidness, alarm, apprehension, and worry. If you're here and you worry, it's because you're fearful. And we, we don't understand that, but we're, here's what we're going after. We're going after the root, not the symptom of it. So worry may be how it fleshes it out, but the truth is the root is fear. And we're going to talk about the truth of that because Here's my definition of fear. False evidence appearing real. Fear is a spirit born of lies. It's where the enemy lies to you and you become fearful. We'll talk about the difference between fear and wisdom, but most of us deal with an unhealthy sense of fear that robs us of our life. And you go, well, how do you know fear is a feeling? No, it's not. It's a spirit that you feel when it comes on you. But it is absolutely a spirit. Because 2 Timothy says so. God did not give us a, let's say spirit. Fear. A spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. The spirit of fear is just like the spirit of shame. It comes to steal your life from you. It comes to rob you of your potential and not let you step into the destiny that God has for you. And fear will show itself in about four ways in a human being. The first one is this, control. I must say control. If you're super fearful, you're going to try to control yourself, your circumstances, and the people around you. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you are control freaks? If you have ever been labeled, I'm a control freak. The, the root of that is that you fear. Control is manipulating and manufacturing your own miracles and your own lifestyle the way that you want it. it it's really playing God in your life. Uh, the next way it shows itself is um, to be disconnected. And I looked up the definition of disconnect. It means to interrupt the connection of or between a life or energy source. If the enemy can get you to believe that God super ticked at you or upset with you, then you will disconnect 
from the very thing that gives you life. Some of you have come into this place and, and you left, but now you're back. Or you went to some other church and now you've come to this one. And the truth is the enemy lied to you about God's house and you disconnected from the very thing he says, don't forsake yourselves assembling together as a lot have because he knows that there's life in God's family and in his house. And the enemy wants you to walk away. In my opinion, you should never walk away from a church unless you move to a city that you can't drive to. You wouldn't, you wouldn't just walk away from a family just because, well, I don't, I don't like the shirt you're wearing, so I'm, I'm out. I, you know what? I don't like the color of the carpet of my mama's house, so I'm not going to Thanksgiving ever again. You know how many people walk away from church over the color of carpet? Do you know how many people walk away from church because I wear weird shirts? Like, it's true. You go, you know how many people walk away because I got a mohawk? You can't pastor a church with a mohawk. Yes, you can. Because it's just who I am. But people let ridiculous, minute things get in the way, and they get lied to, and they choose to lie over the truth, and they become disconnected from the very thing that brought them life. And the next way it fleshes itself out is retreat. If I say retreat. Retreat is where you draw back to seclusion. If the enemy can lie to you and say, you don't have a voice, nobody wants to hear your story, um, you're not smart enough to tell it, then here's what happens. You, you go against the very truth where it says, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Do you know you have a story that people need to hear? But the enemy's lied to you, and so now you're in silence. And you've hidden the greatest light that's ever been given to humanity, and it's the glory of God on the inside of a redeemed and forgiven soul. Everybody needs to see that, and they need to hear it. The next way it fleshes itself out is decline. Decline means this, to refuse to accept, to deny permission to do. You know, the saddest place on the planet is the graveyard. Not because human beings are dead there, but because human beings with dreams are dead there. Dreams that were never lived out solely because of fear. And in themselves, they declined to walk into the very thing God gifted them to do and empowered them to do. In this room, there are dreams dormant in your mind and in your heart, and you won't step into it because you're afraid of it. God says, I have a plan for you. You know the great thing about God's plan? He never asked you to pay for it. He never asked you to wear the pressure of it. He never asked you to figure it out. He just said, believe me for it. So that's for somebody in here. You have a dream that this world needs. Somebody here has an invention this world needs, but you won't pull the trigger on it. Somebody in here, you have a dream that this house needs, and you know you're supposed to step into it, but you've allowed the enemy to lie to you and say, you're not equipped to do it, you're not smart enough to do it, and the list goes on and on and on, and I say, that's not true, because that doesn't line up with the truth of God's word. Fear is one of the greatest things that robs us of our potential. There's so many times in life that some of the things that had the greatest reward in my life, I was afraid to do before I did them. Um, I usually need to know that large rewards take large risks. Um, I remember when God called me to step away from a pretty secure job and go into ministry. I don't, I don't care how spiritual you are, that's scary. Because now you're stepping into something you don't know, you don't know how to do, you're not really sure what it is. But that's where God shows up. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I, was, I remember when I was going to ask Benet to marry me. How many men in here are married? Yeah. Awesome. How many know it's a 50-50 chance? The answer is yes or no. Right? And I know you think, well, like you woke up that day, you got the ring, you set this up, and you went, man, I'm so hot, she's got to say yes. Like I, I, know, I know where you are, man. I got you. But the truth is, she could have said no. And then the, the, here's the question, am I ready for marriage? No. I had, when I asked her to marry, I had no job, broke, like, we broke all the rules of dating we teach in this house. I was an idiot, okay? But she said yes, but I had to push through the fear and focus on the reward, which is a life spent with the most beautiful, talented, gifted woman that God fashioned for me, perfectly made for me, and we are now embarking on 22 years of marriage. We have three awesome kids, a ministry that God has blessed only because I stepped out and into what God was telling me to do. Now, and let me just be honest with some people in here. One of the greatest rewards of my life is when I made the decision to push through the fear and embrace Jesus as my forgiver and leader. 
Anybody tells you that that's, that doesn't cause anxiety or fear is lying. Because you're, step, you're taking a step of faith and you're trusting a God that at the moment you've never seen, you've never heard, you've just heard a message, you've just felt a feeling, and you feel compelled to embrace Jesus as your forgiver and leader, and you don't know what that looks like, you don't know where you're going to be in a year, but yet, if you press into it, the reward on the other side of that decision is the greatest reward that this world has ever seen. So I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not a reality that those moments didn't have pressure and things going on, but you have to learn to press through and focus on the reward and not the fear. So I'm going to give you four ways to reframe your thinking on fear. Number one is this, reframe fear into excitement. How many of you being scared is fun? Come on, guys, raise your hand, because you scare people all the time. How many of you scare your wife, scare your kids? <laughs> Like your greatest goal is to make somebody wet their pants at some point. If you want to scare somebody, somebody's just, psh, okay? Like that's what, that's what we live to do. Why? Because there is some fun in how it makes you feel when you step into fear. And there's always this place where you go, ah, how many of you ever rode a roller coaster before? Like, and you were scared, like you live for the day that you passed the line and you could ride the roller coaster because I just want to ride the roller coaster, I want to ride the roller coaster. And you get and you start up the climb and you got this sinking feeling and you, you may poop your pants at some point, but <laughs> you want to ride the roller coaster. So, like, it's fearful, fearful, fearful. And you take your first dive down that speeding incline and you go into the first loop. And at some point, guess what? It becomes fun. That's just like the spiritual journey. There is <laughs> somebody, went, it wasn't fun about a roller coaster. Anyway. <laughs> I puked on everybody. Okay, so <laughs> go ride it again. Ride it again and ride it again. But it's, it's kind of like a spiritual journey because the spiritual journey has ups and downs. There's valleys and mountaintops. But if you press into the fear and you don't agree with it and you don't agree with a the lie, then it, it's like it, it becomes overtaken by fun and anticipation. Life is an adventure. How many of you want to ride a roller coaster that just goes straight? Nothing happens. You're lying. That's okay, 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 you do? How many train rides do you take to work? Exactly. Nobody wants to ride a train anymore. You know what? It's gonna be like tote coal now. Like it's cool to because that's like old school. Like a roller coaster with no loops and dips is called a train. <laughs> None of you ride a train every day. Because it's not fun. You've got to reframe it. You've been lied to. You've been lied to. Nothing about fear is fun. There is if you push past it and step into it. It's called an adventure. That's why you're not living in adventure because you're letting fear control you. The next one is this. We'll talk because there's some like super processing people that's going, he's crazy. Here's what you got to do. You got to differentiate between fear and wisdom. There is a difference. It may be wise for you not to do something. Some of you in here maybe go, it's not wise to jump out of a perfectly good airplane with satin attached to you by shoestrings. It's not good, okay? For me, I think that's great. It's like the most awesome thing on the planet. Let's jump out of an airplane. But for, and what, I, what we do is we take where we're at on the journey, judge people where they are, and say, well, you should totally jump out of airplanes. No, I shouldn't. I'm good with landing in the plane, okay? So that's, that's fine. I, I, I personally think if you have... A pet snake, it's not wise. <laughs> I don't even know. Get some fish. Like, get something that if it breaks out of the aquarium at night, it won't kill you. Like, it's just not wise. And then some of you crazy people have spiders as pets. I mean, all spiders are poisonous. They'll rot your flesh, kill you, make your teeth fall. I mean, it's crazy. Why? You've got a, a hairy thing crawling on your body. Spiders are here because of the fall. Y'all know that, right? Genesis 3 says so. <laughs> it don't really. Don't go look it up. It's not in there. Some of you want, it's not in there. <laughs> but like, here's what's cool about God. God says you lack wisdom because you hadn't asked for it. If you want wisdom, ask me for it. I'll tell you. There are legitimate healthy fears of things you shouldn't do, but more times than not, humanity by large is controlled by unhealthy fear, and there is a difference. And honestly, you have to pray through what that looks like, because everybody's journey is not the same. Um, and the next thing you have to do is treat fear as a call to action. Here's what I say. Feel the fear, do it anyway. Feel the fear, 
do, pull the trigger. How many hunters in here? People hunt. How many, well, how many deer hunters in here? Okay, there's something called deer fever. How many know what that is? If, if you're bow hunting, you know what it is. If you've ever rifle hunting, you know what it is. It's when the buck steps out and he's got a rack you've been dreaming all over your life and you pull, you pull back and name down on it or you ease up and you look into the scope and you, like, you're two seconds into it and you go, <laughs> how many of you ever had that happen deer hunting? Like you don't even know why because you're afraid. What if I miss? Like you get one shot, maybe two at the most and you, like, you, you do it. <sighs> right? It happens, doesn't it? So what do you have to do hunting? you got to feel the fear, take a breath, and pull the stinking trigger. Some of you have dreams, and you need to pull the stinking trigger. So what if you miss? At least you took a shot. So many people don't even take the shot. Stop allowing fear to control your actions, and use the fact Use the fact that you are fearful, knowing that Satan's trying to talk you out of it because God's calling you into it. And if you can just flip that, great things await you on the other side of fear. The last one is this, value, secu- value courage over security. Survey after survey has shown that people value security over anything else. They will even put themselves in unhealthy relationships or, I mean, stay in unhealthy relationships because they have this false sense of security. Women will stay with men who verbally and physically abuse them. Men will stay with women who verbally and physically abuse them. People will stay in jobs that they hate because they think in their mind that they're secure in that. They've been told if you walk away from him, you'll never get anybody else. If you walk away from her, you'll never get anybody else. If you leave this secure job, and how's this? All your family's told you you're dumb if you leave that job. Even though you're telling them your dream, they're being used by the enemy to squish your dream and keep you in a dead-end place where you're not living your potential. You have to first learn to value courage over security. It's where you get to this place where you consciously kill false security and replace it with the active virtue of courage found in God. Where you step out into what God is calling you. It's where you literally choose the truth over the lie. The problem is, here, here's the biggest problem in our life. Courage cannot be accessed until the commitment is made. Here's what we want. We want the courage before I step into it. So many of us have prayed, God, if you give me the courage, I'll step into it. And he says, that's not how it works. All through the Bible, cross the river, we'll part it. No, cross the river, we'll open it up. No, put your foot in it and I'll split it. There's a step of faith that causes courage to come into your life and enables you to do what God has called you to do. This is a little behind the scenes um, kind of look into pastor's life. I'm back there, it's the green room. I, I, I'm back there and I'm praying, I do all this stuff. This is what I call um, diarrhea zone, right back here. And let me tell you why. Every Sunday, every service, I'm terribly nervous about taking the stage. I've never been shy about the fact that I'm shy and I'm an introvert and being in front of a lot of people causes me stomach issues. So in there is not only the diarrhea zone, but it's also the lie zone. Like everybody thinks, oh, he comes out here, he's going to preach the message, close, it's just going to be awesome, he, he's kind of funny. But here's, here's, what, here's what pastor hears back there. You're not that, when you tell that joke, they're not laughing. You have nothing to say that anybody wants to hear. Everything that you've put together on that page is not going to change a single person's life. Like it's lie after lie after lie after lie. I'm no different than you guys. And this is my calling and this is my dream. But the truth is the enemy every Sunday attacks me right there. And I used to believe, okay, well, when I step out into the light, it'll go away. It's still here. This is true. Every, when you, uh, from now on, just watch me walk out. And you'll see it, because my wife can see it. And I get about right here, and I'm like, please go away, Jesus. Go away. It, let me tell you when it happens. Good morning. Vroom. But I think I'm going to puke till I get to this podium. <laughs> I really do. It's, it's like not fun. But if I don't, I miss the greatest roller coaster ride of my life. So I don't, I don't know what your dream is, but here's what I'm going to tell you. You're going to have to make a commitment if you want the courage to hit you. You're going to have to commit to it. 
Some of you are thinking about getting married. You will not have the courage to be married until the pastor says, by the power invested in me, I now pronounce you married. That whole wedding ceremony, you're a dry mouth. I see it. White fi- I'm waiting on one of y'all to pass out. <laughs> and I know what you're hearing. I don't know if I can do this. But the minute he announces it and you kiss, the anointing to be who you're called to be hits you. That's, that's why you see married couples after that happens, they walk down the aisle. Because that's over. Woo, glad that's over. Because where are they going? Amen. <laughs> so I'll read you a verse. Of, amen. Come on now. All right, so I'm going to read you a verse of Scripture found in Joshua 1, verse 7. Some of you know it, but if you have your Bibles, turn there. Give you a little bit of backdrop. Forty years earlier, uh, before this happens, a group of people were chosen to inherit the promised land. And they went into the promised land and they chose to believe a lie. A group of people came out of the promised land that were sent in to be spies. And they came out and they believed a lie. Because while they were in there, the enemy lied to them and said, you cannot possess this land. The, The inhabitants of it are too big, too powerful. And so they come out and they tell all the people that are waiting to go in. They say, here's a so slick. We, this is their phrase, what they say, we looked like grasshoppers, listen to this phrase, look it up, what they say, in our own sight compared to the people that live there. If you notice, they don't know what they look like to the people that live there. They said, in our own sight, we were inferior. In our own self-image, we were too small. We were not big enough to do what God has called us to do. And they, the Bible says they gave a bad report, so they all died. And never saw the promised land. And there is a promised land for you, and it's not a place. Listen to this, church. It's not a place you go. It's a person you become. But you've got to not agree with a bad report and step into it and take it. He said, all that I've given to you is yours. This is for somebody. All I've given to you is yours. Now go and take it. So we pick up 40 years later, God is reminding the cat who's now going to leave, one of the ones who came out and said, no, 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 we can do it because God is with us. They are nothing. We have the God on our side. Let's go take it. And they chose to believe a lie over what this person was saying. And then God reminds him as he's getting ready to do it. He says, be strong and, everybody say very, very courageous. Very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. And do not turn from it to the right or the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Hear what he's saying, church. He's not saying keep a bunch of rules so you'll be successful. He's saying be strong and very courageous and pay attention to the truth. Because the truth always brings life and the lie always brings death. And it robs and steals from you. He goes on and he says this. I love this. Keep this book of the law. Everybody say truth. Always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. How many of you want to be prosperous in your entire life, all aspects of your life? There's the secret. Everybody wants to know what's the secret of prosperity. Speak and think on the word of God every day. Here's what he's telling Joshua. The lies are coming to your mind, and your external voice has to be louder than your internal voice. Listen to me. The lies come from inside. You all understand this. You have a voice that tells you you're not equipped, you're stupid, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. And he says, here's what I need you to do. Speak the law, the truth, the word of God out loud to silence the inside lie. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Your greatest mistake is reading the Bible silently. Listen to me. Your greatest mistake as a believer is reading the Bible silently. When it's just you and God and you're reading the word, read it out loud. And you will find your faith grows, your power grows, your trust, everything grows. Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not Be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Why? For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. There's a saying about 
courage that says this. Courage is not doing what you've been called to do in absence of fear. It's doing it in spite of it. I wish that was true. But according to Scripture, that's not true. See, I have to tell you this. He says, actually, don't be afraid to do it. I would love to sit up here and say, no, 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 courage is, in spite of the fear, go ahead and do it. But God says, no, 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 keep the word of, like the word of my truth on your mouth so much that you're not even afraid to do it. Like, you know what your dream is, and you know, are you afraid of it? No, I ain't afraid to do that. My God's for me. If he's for me, who can be against me? I'm solid. I can go do this. This is great. Do you know the only thing that Satan ever created on this planet, because he wants to be like God, is the lie. The lie is uniquely satanic. When you speak a lie or you agree with the lie, the Bible says you're agreeing with the father of lies. Lies are the most dangerous thing we're going to talk about because the lie only brings death and destruction and sickness. It's sent to steal and rob you of your destiny, to shroud your eyes over with the fog of fear so that you can't see what God is doing and you can't see the reward and you get stuck. But there's good news. The Bible says God is truth. God is truth. Numbers um, 23, 19 says God is not a man that he should lie. Isaiah 65, 16, because he who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth. How about I say truth? John 17, 17, your word is, no, 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 your word is, let me tell you why it's low in here like that, truth, truth, because the shroud of fear is over you. In Jesus' name, lift the confusion off the minds of people in here. John 17, 17, your word is truth. The Bible says, if you continue in my truth, you will be free. Truth is the greatest thing that this world has ever seen. John 14, 6, Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Can I tell you what truth does? Truth brings healing. Truth brings forgiveness. Truth brings restoration. Truth brings forgiveness. Truth, if there's anything good that has ever happened in your life, it's because truth shined the light on the darkness and it exposed it and sent it away. If anybody gets saved in here, it's because the truth was preached. If any marriage is healed in here, it's because the truth get, came into a problem and made it go away. The, the darkness doesn't expel the light. The light expels the darkness. And it's the light of God's truth that changes a human being. So I'm going to speak some stuff um, kind of over you today. And I, and I, I truly believe this is for somebody. Um, so I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And, and I think this is for somebody um, to receive. And we talked about the lie wants to get you to control, to disconnect, to um, to be in this place where you, you retreat back and you don't step into what God has for you. So I, I, I think this is a word from God um, where the Bible says check all the spirits. So, so I, don't, I don't expect you just to receive this, but I expect you to pray through it. And if it's for you, then you receive it at the end of this. But here's, here's what I believe in all my heart. I think that God is saying to, if not all of us, some of us in here, do not step into control and take it upon yourself to manufacture your life, but just trust me. I didn't ask you to pay for it. I didn't ask you to stress over it. I asked you to believe me for it and step into what I have for you. I'm already in tomorrow. It's not for you to worry about. Don't believe the lie and disconnect from the very thing that is bringing you life because if the, if the vine stays connected to the branch, you will bear all sorts of fruit. I'm your Father in heaven. Stay connected to me and all things will work well. As in Romans, it says, I'm working all things to your good because you are called according to my purpose. Do not retreat back in seclusion because there are people that need to hear your testimony, your story, what I'm doing in your life because a city is made to put on a hill. A light is made to shine, not put under a basket. Please go out into all the world and bring glory to my name by being the best you that you can be. 
you don't have to step back. Listen to this one. You don't have to step back because you are my child. And you have the right to walk in the inheritance that I've already paid for you. You have the right to be the most powerful version of you. You have the right to lay hold of the destiny that I've planned out for you. You need to step into all that I have for you because you are my child. You are adopted into the kingdom of heaven. You are adopted as a son of daughter through the blood of Jesus. You are not of yourself anymore. I have brought you into my family, and therefore I have blessed you with every spiritual blessing from Jesus Christ. I will provide your every need in my riches and my glory. You have no need to fear. For now, because of Jesus, you are no longer a slave to fear. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears have gone. And I'm no longer a slave.
Church, if you would bow your heads and close your eyes. The greatest news in the universe, in all of creation, is that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and raise himself from the dead so that he could adopt you as his children. There's more power in that phrase than we understand. And speaking it over our life in agreement with God's word. Maybe you're here today and you've never made the decision to truly surrender your life to Christ because it scares you to death. I would ask you in this moment, I'm praying for you, that you would see that the light of truth would illuminate your mind and your soul to the reward on the other side of that decision. It's a decision that you've been putting off. I think there's a guy in here right now who's been through several moments like this and you're gripping the back of the chair and you're just wanting this service to be over. But I believe that God is saying to you, this is just the beginning. If you'll just surrender to me. I think there's a woman here who struggles with fear. And you've been diagnosed with OCD. And you have agreed with that and you confess that and you tell people, I have OCD. And I say in the name of Jesus, you do not because you're born again and you're created in the image of God and you're beautifully and wonderfully made and that is not true over your life. And you have just heard from God and he's exposed the root of your fear. And today he says, would you surrender it to me? So as the staff and the prayer team come down front, what are you afraid of? The whole premise of this series is to, for you to come to the altar and never come to the altar again for this issue. So first and foremost, if you're here and you've embraced, you just, just then you felt, man, I need to surrender my life to Jesus, then I want you to step out where you are. I want you to come down front so people want to talk with you. Maybe you're here and you need to step into what God has called you to do, but you're afraid. You want to be the husband God's called you to be. You want to be the wife. You want to be the kid. You want to be the employee. Every aspect of life, the devil wants to shroud you in fear. But God comes into this place and speaks truth and says, you are my child. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If, if I'm for you, who can be against you? I'm already in tomorrow. I've mapped out your entire life, and I've gave you good things to do that I've prepared in advance for you to do. All you have to do is trust me. In this moment, just trust me. And maybe it's a financial issue. Maybe it's a job issue. I don't care what it is, but you know what it is. So I'm going to pray when I say amen. If you need prayer, if you need healing, if you need anything, don't miss this opportunity. Father God, thank you for today. And God, I do pray that when people take the first step, they're overrun with courage and they come down and find the peace that surpasses all understanding as they do business with you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, would you come down front right now? Don't. Let's just pray, church, and celebrate what God done here, has done here today. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your goodness, your kindness that leads people to repentance. And God, the fact that your desire is to heal our hearts and pursue us with an everlasting love to draw us into a life that blows our mind, an adventurous life, a one that you have already mapped out, paid for, but one that we, you ask us to take a step of faith into. So God, I cancel out all fear today in Jesus' name because the truth is perfect love casts out all fear. And we need to come to a revelation that our Father in heaven absolutely is crazy madly in love with his children 
In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Had fun today. Give Jesus a round of applause.